Welcome to our event tonight. My name is Tim Taylor. I'm the CEO of Vila, and it's an honor to be here with everybody, and uh, it's especially an honor to be on stage with some leaders in the dairy ecosystem. And uh, I'm humbled to be with this group because we have three dairy farmers, leading dairy farmers, uh, three guys representing emerging technology companies, and a cheese producer. It's like, you know, the priest, the rabbi, and the preacher walked <laughs> under bars, one of those things, right? So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, we're honored to have you here. Uh, the name of the, of the event is Elevate. We're here to elevate the industry through tackling challenges in the dairy ecos ecosystem through technology and collaboration. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our uh, joint uh, partnering companies that put on the event. I think you'll see their names around and, and their videos going, so I won't list all of them. But the goal is to create a collaborative effort here among lots of companies uh, so we can tackle these challenges. Uh, I, I would also like to thank uh, the people that put on the event behind the scenes, especially Sue Hart and Karen Lawley of VES Artex. So I'd like to give you guys a, a round of applause. Sue has big pull with the man upstairs. That's why the weather's so great this week. So <laughs> stay close to Sue Hart, okay? So, uh, so the purpose of the evening is to have a, an honest, laid on the line discussion with leaders in the industry. Uh, unvarnished, tackle some tough issues. And so we have three or four key questions that they'll bounce back and forth with. But on the screen, you probably will see some polling questions. And uh, you can QR code that, bring out your camera, clean off the lens, and uh, take a picture of that. And then everything will happen, and you guys can fill in some, uh, some of these polling questions. And um, they basically are addressing the key issues that we're discussing, discussing tonight. So if you guys don't mind doing that, we'll show the results of the poll as we're asking questions to the panel. So just take a minute. I'll hum the Jeopardy theme song for you. No, actually, I'm tone deaf, so we won't do that. So that would be really a bummer. So, But while you're doing that, let's get started. So the questions tonight with our panelists are to engage the issues that are facing us that we can attack, improve, take care of with technology, collaboration, and an open industry. So I'd like to introduce first um, our panelists. When I introduce them, they're gonna take a couple minutes and just share with you an overview of either their dairy farm or their processing plant or the technologies that they're representing. So you know, I'd like to start with uh, Ken McCarty, McCarty Family Farms. I was on his farm last week, great guy, Colby, Kansas. Ken, tell us about your farm. Sure. So uh, thank you, Tim, and thank you for everyone for allowing us to be a part of this. Uh, my name is Ken McCarty from McCarty Family Farms, and we are fourth-generation family-run dairy farm, originally from northeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, family's dairy started in 1914 uh, by my great-grandfather, Taylor McCarty. Grandfather Harold took that over, and in the early 90s, uh, my dad, who took it over from my grandfather, began to look for growth opportunities that would allow for my brothers and I to come back to the dairy if we so chose. We ended up settling in Northwest Kansas, where I uh, started out milking about 800 cows in Rexford, grew to eventually encompass uh, where we're at today, which would include five different sites, three in Northwest Kansas, one in Southwest Nebraska, a partnership farm in uh, West Central Ohio, uh, totally, uh, total encompassing about 13,000 wet cows. Um, our family is uh, heavily involved in third-party auditing. So our farms are Validus Dairy Care certified. We're non-GMO project verified. Uh, we are B Corp certified. We're involved in the farm program, uh, BQA certified. Basically, every sticker that we can stick on our milk product, uh, we do. Um, we, be we believe that it brings value to our farms. Uh, we, we hope that it brings value to our customer. Uh, we have been a, a direct ship supplier to Denone North America for going on 10 years now. Uh, have an on-farm evaporative milk condensing plant at the Rexford location. 
that condenses in the ballpark of about 685,000 pounds of raw milk a day into pasteurized heavy cream and condensed skim milk that goes into Dan and yogurt products. So we, we feel like we have a, a heavy responsibility to a brand larger than ourselves, um, heavily involved in their sustainability, soil health programs, uh, climate mitigation programs, and are taking a variety of steps to try to overcome what we perceive are threats to not only our future in the dairy industry, but uh, the future of the dairy industry as a whole. So happy to talk about that tonight, and I'm gonna pass it on to you, Brian. Thanks, Ken. We're Brian Hoyan from Homestead Farms in uh, Indiana. And the, one of the most peaceful dairies I've ever been on, I'm thinking of starting a yoga program <laughs> in his uh, robot barn, so. <clears throat> so yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm Brian Hoyan from Homestead Dairy. Um, you can follow us on, on Facebook and YouTube and now TikTok, I guess. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so this is a picture of our dairy. Again, you know, I'm also a fourth generation dairy farmer. Uh, the dairy I was born and raised on is there on the bottom of the screen. And then you can see there in the, on the, towards the top of the screen, we got our, our robot facility. So in 2017, we put in 36 lately, 84 robots. Uh, so we're milking about 2,200 cows on robots. We're milking about 2,700 conventionally. Uh, and then clear on the top of the screen, we also put in eight auto feeders. So we're feeding our calves uh, also on automatic feeders. And um, so yeah, uh, our conventional dairies, we've been running Affy Farm, heifers, we got cow managers. So we're very adept to using technology to help improve uh, cow comfort and, and animal welfare. So uh, again, I'll get into more of those, those answers to these questions later. So I'll go ahead and pass it on to JJ. Thanks, Brian. JJ right. Pagel from uh, Pagel's Ponderosa, closest dairy to us here. Howdy, everybody. JJ Pagel uh, from Kewanee County, third generation dairy farmer. Uh, I dairy farm with uh, my sister, Jamie, and my brother, Brian. Uh, our farm, uh, my grandpa purchased in 1946, borrowed some uh, money from a neighbor. He came back from World War II. Uh, we started with eight cows and some pigs and some chickens. I don't know which slide I got next here. <laughs> so not with all the barns, so I apologize for that. Uh, my father purchased the dairy in uh, 1980 with about 65 cows, uh, which is grown today. Uh, we're milking about 8,500 cows on two sites, uh, getting a third site uh, ready. We raise all our heifers in-house. Uh, we have a couple hundred that are um, at a heifer raiser currently, uh, but we're working on bringing them all home. Um, we enjoy having all our animals on site. Uh, we feel that's very important to us. Uh, we can keep an eye on them, making sure they're well taken care for. Uh, we just feel more comfortable that way. Um, as far as technologies go, um, you know, we started off and I looked at what my grandfather did and, and we had one of the first parlors in Kewanee County and we were very excited for that. And then all of a sudden, uh, in 1985, my dad put in a double eight herringbone, thought it was revolutionary, and now we got robotic cow milkers and rotary parlors and all these different things. So it's, it's a neat world. Um, I have four children of my own and eight nieces and nephews. And the question that I get asked a lot and that I ask myself a lot is, um, how can we get things set up for them? And then what kind of work are they gonna wanna do and how are they gonna wanna manage things? compared to the way I do, because I look at what my dad did, and what my grandfather did, and what my brother, sister, and I are doing today with our teams, and then what our children and their teams are gonna do. Um, we're very excited for that, but so getting to work with all these different technologies is very exciting. I mean, most of us, most of us live our lives by a cell phone nowadays, so uh, a lot of neat apps, a lot of neat stuff, and we'll talk about that later. By the way, they make some amazing cheese there, so go online. Pagel's Ponderosa cheese, little plug there. <laughs> so <laughs> Thanks, this, is, Tim. this is Paul Repnicki. He's with Grande Cheese. Uh, I met Paul when he was on the advisory board at uh, Valley Ag when, when Mark and I were there. Uh, Paul, we're excited to have you sitting right in the middle here representing processors. So I've heard the word enemy many times when dairies are pro talking about processors. So we love you and you know, we're all good here. So. <laughs> Well, tell us, tell us about uh, Grande Cheese. <clears throat> well, well, thanks for that introduction, Tim. And um, I am happy to be here because, yeah, we're in the middle of things, but each one of us is an essential part in the whole food <clears throat> chain, right? So 
um, we all, that's why we have to learn to cooperate together and, and to get this done. Grande is a Wisconsin-based cheese company. It was founded in 1941. Um, we currently have seven production facilities in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we currently have 76 dedicated producer dairies that are 96% of them are within a 50 mile drive of those seven production facilities. So in my role as Grande's Herd Health and Wellness Veterinarian, I support the quality of milk production practices of those dairies. Um, Grande produces, we like to say, the finest Italian cheeses that money can buy. Um, our business model is to market to independent pizzeria restaurant um, operators. So we don't, we're not retail in the grocery store on our cheese side of the business. We focus solely on um, independent restaurants as far as using high quality grande Italian cheese products. Now if you're in the cheese business, you're also in the whey business. And so the other part of the graphic there I have is we have the commodity um, whey proteins and um, lactose that we saw in the commodity market, but we've also got a portfolio of specialty ingredient products, um, and this fits into the discussion with how we interface with um, multinational CPG or consumer packaged good companies. When they buy those products, they have, we're feeling a lot of pressure for requirements from them as far as information about where our milk supply comes from. So how we think about sustainability in a big, bigger picture from Grande, we're um, we look at it, we talk about our social responsibility with four pillars. We talk about the responsibility for the sustainability of our business as a cheese company. We talk about the environment, obviously, and the carbon footprint that our cheese plants have. Um, to our employees, who we call associates, so we have a social responsibility to our associates. And in our culture statement, we talk about working for a purpose greater than ourselves, and so that's activities that we do in the community. So we look at that as, as grand as a company, um, for our producer database, we have a program we call PACE, which is Producers of Surrey Consumers of Excellence. And the PACE program basically has those same four pillars because our dairy operators are also interested in sustainability of their business. Their workers, their employees, their associates on their farm, their, their impacts on the environment. And our dairies do a lot of tremendous things in the local communities. And so we want to tie that all together as part of our Grande story. Great, thanks Paul. So I'd like to introduce you to Pablo Lamberto. We met when Pablo was at uh, Zoetis, and uh, I was at Valley Ag, and uh, last year I connected with a company in Northern Ireland called Catali. It's a vision and AI company, and I'm blessed to be on the board there, and Pablo's now the Chief Revenue Officer, and just an amazingly experienced guy. So glad that uh, we connected over the last, like, three, four months, and Pablo, <coughs> tell us about Catali. Yeah, so um, thank you again. And uh, well, we are here to manage the transition about uh, what would be uh, the new technology that could be enable the uh, producers for the future to really be in a, uh, you know, sustainable in the long term. That, that is what we are talking about here. So uh, Catalyze basically is an autonomous uh, video monitoring uh, solution that we are bringing to the market. Uh, it's kind of a look as scary, like autonomous video, HI, AI kind of things. So what we are doing is basically capturing images of the, ca of the cattle, and uh, through this uh, artificial intelligence, we are training our algorithms to identify deviations of the behavior of the cows or on the kind of phenotypic kind of uh, shapes of the car, like uh, uh, body condition scores. So what uh, we are doing, and uh, you can see there, so we can monitor with very off-shelf, uh, 120 box, 150 box uh, Amazon cameras, uh, monitoring the cows every single day, and we can predict uh, the um, scores for uh, lameness on one side, for early intervention, or in the near future, this uh, variation of the body composition score. So that is pretty huge on uh, how that data could be uh, connected with other uh, actions that you have to do in the, in the dairy uh, in order to take uh, early interventions on, on those. So, uh, you can see there on the on the camera that is a, one of the examples of the setup. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we are using those cameras uh, on uh, on the top of the cows. We are evaluating that those cows every single day, and we are providing the insights that are connected with uh, uh, actionable things that uh, you can do for uh, modifying the management or probably advise uh, the crew on the on the on the barn what they need to do with those uh, with those cows. So um, we are uh, uploading all that information in a very simple and accessible uh, app that is uh, available for you in every place where you were. 
And uh, that information is also uh, uh, connected to any herd management system that you have uh, in, your, in your farm. So um, what uh, we are trying to do, and I see, uh, yes, so in that one, uh, what we are trying to do with the technology, technology is the, the biggest enabler from uh, sustainability. So all, all the way through all those years, uh, the dairy industry did pretty well on managing that technology in order to improve sustainability. Uh, and in this case, uh, I put in the first row there, if they, they, even if they, the, our cows could talk, it's gonna be very difficult for the dimension that we have in the United States, understand every one of them. Or if, even if you are understanding every one of them, managing 2,000, 6,000 cows is gonna be impossible. So we need to enable technology for uh, working for us and for our people on the ground to really uh, understand the cows and try to provide to them the best uh, management practices and uh, all the comfort that they need in order to produce. So uh, food is important and uh, that is connected with uh, animal welfare and sustainability. So labor is another thing that is uh, uh, probably uh, a big struggle today. Uh, we are trying to manage uh, the uh, new technology, not creating more uh, tasks that they are not uh, uh, currently done on the, on, the, on the dairy. So we are not trying to generate more labor in other areas. So that would be a kind of not uh, uh, very making sense kind of a, a return. And at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is provide you as a producer with the uh, traceable data that you can present to uh, you know, retailers or probably processors to say, I am doing a good job, this is my uh, information, you can have access to that, and that would be your right to do it. So um, I, I would say on the sustainability side for the environment, the um, uh, objective that we have is that we can help with, we can help with the first uh, approach that we have with this technology to reduce lameness around 10% all over. We will be sequestrating something about a half a ton per cow per year from every single cow in the, in the world. So that, that is a kind of aspirational thing, but generally it's actionable and we can uh, probably demonstrate that. So with that. Thanks, Pablo. For you. So I'd like to introduce Dan Schmidt. We just met tonight. Uh, the, I think you know, Pablo's technology is addressing one key area, you know, animal welfare. And Dan's company, which is called Hydrogreen, is the president of Hydrogreen, addresses, I think, a global issue, and it's water. It's amazing. Dan, tell us about it. Thank you, Tim. Uh, good evening. Thanks for the opportunity. I'd like to introduce you to uh, Hydrogreen and Hydrogreen Global. Hydrogreen is an ag tech company, obviously, that's why we're here. Our mission is to help uh, farmers and ranchers maintain independence and have on-farm uh, on fresh feed daily. So the concept many of you have heard of is probably as fodder, and fodder has been around for many years, but it wasn't really sustainable and it wasn't um, able to feed large herds. So Hydrogreen was actually created in um, 2015, and in 2020 it was acquired by Cubic Farms. Since that time, this last year, post-COVID, we've really focused on the product and building a company that will partner with farmers to maintain and build sustainability on farm. So you all hear all the challenges we're faced with every day. Uh, Mother Nature can be unpredictable. The beauty of Hydrogreen is ultimately we're trying to put some predictability and simplicity and consistency on farm, on your ration every day. So we were founded by farmers, and for us that means a lot. There are other technology companies that have experiences with just big tech and big data, but both Cubic Farms and specifically Hydrogreen were, were founded to solve a problem. Our founder was Dial Grow. Uh, Dial had a small cattle ranch in Idaho, could not find healthy, sustainable uh, feed and nutrition for, for his farm, uh, for his herd. He saw the fodder system, liked the concept, but realized it did not work at scale. And so he started the development of this concept. We now have two different systems that are called multi-level systems, grow level systems. You'll see videos of them here in a bit. And essentially we take seed to super feed in six days. So you put seed on a level, the, the, the system sits in one place. We simply add light, water, and environmental controls. It's called controlled environment agriculture or vertical farming is a catchphrase and we can convert and sprout uh, barley, wheat, triticale 
into fresh, healthy feed in less than six days. So at the push of a button, we can run an entire crop, depending on the size of your herd, to add to part of your ration that is a super feed and delivers extreme health benefits to both dairy and beef cattle. So you'll see a little bit more on our videos um, in the next section. Sustainability is obviously a big question that's gonna come up in our conversation today. And for us, it's really doing more with less. Less land, less water, less labor, less headache. More nutrition, more deliverables, and more independence and consistency on farm. So before Mark Dornick gets going, probably all of you or most of you know Mark. Um, Mark's with VES Artex. I've been associated with the company for the last two years. And I just want to acknowledge that I wouldn't be here without Mark being my mentor in the industry. I didn't know the difference between a cow and a heifer <laughs> my first week at Valley Ag, so here I am, a CEO of a software company in herd management. Without Mark, I would have been a total failure, so thanks, Mark, for <laughs> being my partner. <laughs> thanks, Tim. And thank you for everybody that was able to join us tonight for this great event. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, ES Artex. Uh, we are based in both Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, as well as uh, Abbotsford, British Columbia. Uh, we formed our combined company in January of this year. Our core product lines are dairy steel, so uh, gates and headlocks and stall loops for inside the barn, and also ventilation products, fans, of course, but, and cow cooling, cow comfort. That's been our core products. Uh, our parent company is Turntide Technologies, and Turntide brings us a lot of uh, resources, but also a very special motor technology that is very efficient in electricity and uh, helps drive sustainability and operational efficiencies for the farm. And so with that, we like to create what I call the, the, the animal-centered environment, which puts the cow in the center of our focus, or the animal. And I refer to it as Maslow's hierarchy for cow. You know, what food, shelter, water, the environment, those things that the, the, the cow gets uh, influenced by every single day. And that's where we, everybody is trying to influence. And we do that through the systems around that. And those systems are often very disconnected, whether it's feeding operations and, and management and herd health, or the other side of the barn where we're getting rid of manure, or, or those things. But all those systems are all trying to affect what? That Maslow's hierarchy that's touching the cow. And we need to keep that cow in the focus. So we call that the animal center environment. And outside of that is all of the people on the farm, the veterinarians and consultants that come in and help the farm, and off-farm suppliers, such as the people on stage here to my left, and uh, downstream processors like Paul, uh, all trying to work with that same thing. And we're getting farther and farther away from what the center where we need to be focused. And we're all looking for those same operational efficiencies, profitability. Uh, we call it business intelligence. Maybe we should call it dairy intelligence. We're all trying to get to that same thing. But you got to remember, the cow should be our focus. What do we influence that touches that cow? So uh, as I mentioned, our core technology is, is hardware. But at VSR Techs, we know we need to move away from just being a hardware company. We need to move into a solution company and using technology to deliver those solutions as value-added uh, solutions to the customer. So on top of our hardware, we've built a program called Dairy Boss. And Dairy Boss is a cloud-based program that brings together some uh, simple things like weather. I, I've told Brian before, I th always thought weather was boring until I really got into this job. <laughs> and uh, weather really uh, is, is interesting how we start applying that and seeing what the changes are. Uh, bring in other information from other uh, cloud sourced APIs into Dairy Boss. And then we started building on top of our hardware, adding sensors. You might think sensors just are temperature and humidity, but we're also looking very closely at what effects ammonia have and other things that are going in the barn. And sensors that are starting to measure water and also other sources are uh, consumable of electricity and now into even into gas. And so as we keep moving to the right, we put those together in what we're calling an intelligent barn making that barn be much more responsive. The animal has changed over time. If we think about what the animals looked like in 2005, 2006, before genomics came out, and the genomics said that start, tra start trajectory that went up to the right, the animal has changed, but have our barn environments kept up to the animal? And I would say that we haven't. So again, keeping the animal in mind, what can the barn do to automatically change or be more responsive to the animal and not needing human interaction? As we keep going farther to the right, we'll add in all the other sources around the farm of herd and feed management, 
and other cow, individual cow information, say from you know, a cattle eye or other uh, companies that have sensors, to say how do we optimize that farm environment. So we call it Dairy Boss. Uh, we're just getting going and it's been exciting so far. Thanks, Mark. So I call it the Connected, Intelligent, Sustainable Farm. That's, that's my mantra for it. But, uh, so a few of you mentioned the S word. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know if it's a capital S or a lowercase s. We talked about that last yeah. week. So sustainability. It means different things to different people. Honestly, you know, when you talk to dairy farmers about sustainability, it's the most negative word in the list that you ask, right? So Ken, for you, and then Dan, and then Paul, what does it mean to you? How does it impact your business? So, you know, from the perspective of, of McCarty Family Farms, um, and, and what we try to talk about um, when we, when we, when people ask us this question, you know, it really comes back to sustainability begins with having a profitable business because I can be the greenest dairy in the world. And if I go broke doing it or the greenest tech service provider in the world, but if I go broke doing it, it's all for nothing. So it starts with economic sustainability, having a profitable business model that allows my business to be here tomorrow, next month, next year, you know, 50 or 100 years from now. That's the goal, right? But beyond that, as, as, and we were a bit naive to this growing up in northeastern Pennsylvania with a very diverse economic uh, portfolio that kind of fed the area. Um, and, and ag was just a very small part of it. But then when we moved to Northwest Kansas, what became very evident to us was that our business could have a real tangible impact on the local community, both from an environmental point of view, but most importantly, and what was most tangible to us was from a social point of view. You know, at one point we were putting close to 60 some kids into the local school system that had graduating classes of 15 kids. So like from that point of view, sustainability began to take a, a very, a, a much bigger well-rounded uh, uh, place in our life. Mm. And we began to view sustainability from the point of view of, yeah, hey, I need to make money and I need to pay down my, I need to pay my bills and I need to be here to, for tomorrow. But I also need to identify the risk factors that put my business at, uh, at risk of potentially not being here because, hey, I matter in this community now. Hmm. So what it became to, what we began to, to focus on was, and it's all kind of encapsulated back into this B Corp certification, was, hey, it matters how much, in our particular area, it matters how much water I use and how, how am I wa more water efficient not only in my row crops, uh, but on my dairy farm, in my milk processing plant, but also how can I inspire the, the row crop farmers that feed my dairy to become more water efficient? And that might mean that I take a, a, a big bet on some sort of new technology that maybe it sucks, maybe it's great, <laughs> but hey, hopefully I can, I can test it and show them that, hey, this works and you can adopt these practices and become more, more economically viable, become more, more environmentally viable. But then beyond that, you know, we, we begin to think about it more holistically from a sustainability point of view. You know, how do I reinvest into my communities? How do I bring in young people that are gonna have more kids that feed my school system? Because when we look at our business and we identify short-term, mid, and long-term threats, you know, short-term threats, and for those of us that are dairy farmers, and well, frankly, any of us, labor, right? Like, hey, finding people that are willing to do the jobs that we have to do, that's always the short-term threat. Mid-term threat from our point of view is labor and community loss. Mm -hmm. It's extremely hard to recruit a, a CPA or a DVM or a flipping milker in a community that has no school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Long-term, labor, community, water. You know, so when you dovetail all that back in together, it really doesn't matter if, if you really like are passionate about carbon sequestration. Good for you. Maybe you're passionate about water conservation. Awesome. 
at the end of the day, are you trying to make a positive difference? That's the point of sustainability that I take away from it. Hmm. You know, and we've chosen to take the model of trying to put concrete KPIs around that, you know, working with platforms that that monitor our environmental impact, whether that be, you know, uh, you know, gallons of water per hundred weight produced or or carbon uh, our carbon footprint or, you know, therms per ton of product produced, whatever. You know, there, there's a, a litany of different KPIs that you can, can plug into your system. But at the end of the day, what it really comes back to is, do you frankly give a crap about doing a better job than you did yesterday? That to me is sustainability. So it's about measurability. It's about the physical environment, but it's also about the society around you and your impact there. Yeah, I, you know, I mean. I hadn't considered that. That's for those of us that live in the middle of nowhere, and that's really. I drove three hours last week to yeah, see no, you in the middle of nowhere. Very scenic in Eastern yeah, Colorado. It was, very, it was yes, amazing. Isn't it? For those of you that have been there, it's it's great. <laughs> but no, I mean it's it's a huge deal, you know. Yeah. And uh, for us, and hey, we were naive to the fact that it really mattered where we were at in northeastern Pennsylvania too, you know. And we employed like three people, right? So like, we didn't mean anything to local economy, but collectively we did. Yeah. Um, it's the multiplier effect, right? Right. Yeah. So from our point of view, you know, like, hey, sustainability, we, we choose to take a different path because we think that it matters to our customer. We think it matters to the consumer. Are we right? Who knows? I think we are. I'm betting, like, I don't know, four yeah. generations yeah. work on the fact that I think we are. But uh, at the end of the day, what it really comes down to is do you care or not care? Key variable, water. Dan, you're in the business of saving water. By the way, I just read a book called Let There Be Water. I don't know if you guys have read it. It's about the usage of water in Israel. It's a great story. Dan, it's a global issue, yeah, hot absolutely. topic. Where do you guys play on that one? You know, thanks for the answer, Ken. It's perfect. And, and so sustainability, as we know, it can mean so many different things to different people. Uh, at the hydrogreen, we believe that we can reduce water consumption for fresh feed by 90% versus traditional um, feed and for traditional forages. So that itself, we could go through a number of different savings mm -hmm. on how we can put fresh feed on farm. That being said, your story really speaks to the heart of what I think hydrogen is most about, and that's about the family farm. We have a situation right now out west, not as impacted as much here as it is you get to Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, there's a significant drought. There's a prolonged drought going on. And there are small ranchers and, and, and herdsmen who are trying to decide if they're going to stay in business. Um, we have a, one particular gentleman named Mike Rigby. He's uh, become unintentionally our poster child. Uh, and the reason is that we were able to install some systems on his farm, and he literally said this saved our farm. He's like, I did not want to have to be the one when I got to the pearly gates that told our fourth generation I had to sell out because of lack of water rights. So it's, that's, a, that's a profound message. And to your point about what is sustainability, it's more than just a few cost savings. It's about independence. It's about choice of family farms, family dairies, uh, small and large, her large herds. So for us, we, we do believe that having ag technology not just for the sake of technology, but for practical applications that can give um, herdsmen a choice, dairymen a choice as to you don't have to import cotton seed 1,000 miles for part of a ration. We can, on, we can put, grow some of that on farm and every morning with the touch of a button, you have a portion of your ration, which is super healthy feed available for either beef or dairy cows. So uh, I appreciate your comment about communities. I'm from Kansas. And so I've also seen that uh, transition with some you know, small towns. And I, 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 it resonates to me to understand that it's more than just about dollars and cents and savings. It is about the community. And we are part of that community. So that's also sustainable. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So Paul, you're, so you're in the middle between the consumers downstream and the processors, to, uh, producers upstream. So you guys feel squeezed on this issue of sustainability? 
I, I think we just feel we're part of it. Okay. Right? So you you open the question with a comment that sustainability has a negative connotation to it, and I'm sure within our cheese and manufacturing plants where they're trying to establish green practices and sustainability, that usually comes along with more to-do lists, more reg maybe regulations, maybe documentation that we didn't have to do before. So when you look at, and when we go to our producer dairies with here we're trying to protect your markets, we need this information from you, now you need to do this type of training, you need to do this. It does, it's easy to have it spiral into a negative discussion. Um, but I think you got to look at it in what Ken set up is you have to be a sustainable business first and be able to be profitable to stay in business. And thinking about what Mark said about, you know, keeping the cows central, it's really the successful dairy farm businesses that can successfully care for the cows. And so if I'm a cow, I want to live in a profitable dairy because I'm going to get the resources I need to be, be a healthy So cow. they need access to the financials, basically. You need financial business. You share, I, you share your financials with your cows, guys? <laughs> That's what Paul's asking for. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Yeah. The, Go ahead. No, we're not. But we also, we want to have a dedicated producer supply going forward. And if that producer isn't demonstrating the behaviors they need to do to stay in business in the long term, they're we know farming. they're only going to supply us for milk for so long. Meanwhile, we're trying to grow our demand for products. So how do we partner with the right dairies that are going to be in the long term with us, right? And I think yeah. it starts with bus business. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, that's great. Great answers, guys. Brian, Pablo, you're both in the business of animal welfare. Your consumers downstream care for it. How do you deal with that issue and visibility to downstream stakeholders? Well, that's something that, that we really started focusing on uh, really back in 2015 when, uh, you know, we were uh, required to do something different the, the way we were raising our calves. And, and you know, we started thinking about how, um, how we were, you know, raising calves in hutches and, you know, how does that look to, to the consumer and how, you know, can you take care of, of calves in a different way that might be <coughs> better as far as animal welfare and how the consumer feels? Because you know, it's not just about how we feel, it's also about how the consumer feels, how we're handling our cattle. And so uh, that was why we kind of took the direction for auto feeders. It's the same, you know, one of the same reasons why we, we ended up putting in robots. Um, it was again for you know, being able to tell the story that we are giving the cow the freedom to do what she wants when she wants to do it. And, and so that's kind of, um, you know, how we ended up, you know, improving. We, you know, feel like we are improving our animal welfare um, by allowing the cow the freedom to, to do what she wants. Pablo, what you no, I, I would say that the, the first things I would be hating myself if I not acknowledge the uh, um, uh, how the dairy industry in general, globally, it's uh, embracing technology and the results that uh, it's having. But also, particularly in the U.S., as a driver force for this uh, technology adoption and how uh, we are improving uh, all these years. So, uh, database, uh, the FAO report, uh, is uh, in a decade, uh, starting in uh, 2006, uh, 2005. Uh, the dairy industry in North America just reduced uh, greenhouse emission significantly and while increasing production. So uh, that is, is, a, is a, you know, the only thing is embracing technology and applying technology. So uh, dairy farmers and specifically the U.S. dairy farmers did this, that transition several years ago with reproduction and uh, genomic uh, selection. Now we are doing that with uh, all the sustainability KPIs that we are, they are implementing using technology. So uh, uh, from our side on the, uh, I can't believe that as a veterinarian I am working in the software company, right? But what we are trying to provide to the producers is that the technology needs to be uh, simple and easy to apply first. Uh, second one uh, needs to be easily uh, uh, integrated with all data sets and uh, promoting action to what they need to do now, not uh, probably trying to elaborate too much more. And uh, I totally agree. In order to be sustainable, you have to provide uh, some kind of evidence on the return of investment on the technology. And uh, uh, we uh, need to provide now to downstream all the way to the, to the consumers this uh, uh, track record of uh, how well we are doing. So consumers are very concerned about 
what the food looks like, where they are coming, how the animals are treated for producing that food. So that is a great opportunity. That is a positive note that we have. Uh, and being using technology with success for all this year, dairy producers can have opportunity to say, look, I am doing like this with this track record that is not uh, my just blah, blah, blah. It's basically database. And we can have a, a really track uh, records to support what we are doing. So uh, I, I would say for, for us, using technology, uh, it's uh, probably the only way that we can uh, continue to advance. But on, a, on the other side, the technology has to provide producers the simplicity in order to implement and take uh, uh, basically uh, direct actions on what we are telling to them to do. So great response. Thanks. So speaking of technology, JJ, Mark, JJ, you have a big commitment to technology. I've been on your dairy a couple of times, big adopters. Mark, you grew up on a dairy. You've been at the forefront of dairy technology your whole career. And the technology train is accelerating. What do dairy farms need in terms of technology implementation to be practical <coughs> and to make it easy on you guys? So I think there's a lot of things that, that we measure already. Ken said there's KPIs, all that stuff. I mean, we track everything. We have several different dashboards that we run off of. I think a couple different things we need to look at is basically everything that goes into our barns and everything that comes out. So we're literally, everything we can do to make the cow's lives easier, to make the employees that are working with the animals' lives a little bit easier. And then we gotta start measuring everything that comes out of the backside of a cow. Because now people are putting in digesters, now we're getting compressed natural gas systems, now we got people talking nutrient recovery. These are all measurables that we need to start taking care of, paying attention to, and monetizing. The other part of that is I think we're gonna have to pay attention to these things because one day it's gonna be our license to operate. So we gotta pay attention to what's going in, what's coming out. Uh, water was a resource that was brought up earlier today. Um, we, we measure how much water goes in, so I can tell you how many gallons per hundred weight of milk I get, but I can't tell you where these 50 gallons went for this cow and these 10 gallons went for this cow and that. So, you know, measuring that, water is a resource, um, you know, that we take for granted. Um, somebody earlier in the day had said, you know, 1% of water that we have today is unused. 99% of it has been reused in some way, situation, recycled, shape, or form. Uh, the other thing is, is what kind of technologies are out there that we're not currently doing yet that can be immeasurable that the cow can do without changing her everyday activities? So is there a way that the cow can get onto the deck as she's being milked? We can tell if she's pregnant, we can do a preg two check. We can tell if she's got a hot quarter. There's conductivity in those types of things and there's companies that are out there saying <clears throat> they're close, but is there certain things that we can do that we can detect so that the cow can just go up to the parlor, get milked, she can go back, grab a bite to eat, grab a drink and go lay down. And what kind of information can we get while she's doing those, those things? Mark, what's your take on it? Yeah, I remember the first adopting technology was really a selfish reason. As I was a herd manager, I just, my feet were so sore from walking around all the time, I wanted something in my hand that had my cow information. So it was really a selfish reason to start. But, uh, you know, that was in the 90s, and, you know, Palm Pilots were really cool back then, if you know, <laughs> a little bit. But uh, I got one from Paul, probably, actually. But, uh, no, the technology's got to also build upon what JJ said. It's got to be able to be measurable. Uh, Ken and I had this conversation once. They, they have databases and spreadsheets of all this information, and when they get down to filling out some of those answers on the, the audits, they kind of go, yeah, we did good, or didn't we? You know, it, it's just not connecting enough dots, and so it's that interoperability. Um, they have enough information. Dairymen don't need, sorry, they have too much data. Dairymen have enough data. Yeah. We need to supply solutions and answers. You know, to connect that information. But Be more proactive instead of reactive. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Correct. So I'd like to thank the panel, audience, for your attention tonight. Thanks, guys. It was a great discussion, and appreciate your time.